Okay, uh, let's get started. Well, thanks again for coming along to this uh, second half of this online course in using non-volatile memory. Um, last week, we're, uh, where I'll do to start off with is just recap what we discussed last week a bit and summarise it. Uh, so, um, what we started talking off uh, about last week, uh, and we'll finish off this week, uh, is all around this new hardware, uh, these Intel Optane uh, memory modules called DCPMMs, um, which are a version of non-volatile or persistent memory, which you can use inside memory channels to give you very large capacity and very high performance compared to other methods of storing data long term. So it has these sort of two properties. One is that it's large, and that's because the way the hardware works, you can pack many, many more um, storage cells closer together to give you a larger volume. Uh, and then because of the way the hardware works, it lets you store data long term without having to maintain power to the devices. So it's persistent. So it has these two different features, capacity and persistence. Um, and what we're looking at is how whether it's useful for your applications or how you exploit it from your applications. Uh, and it's always worth bearing in mind that uh, people may be interested in one or other or both of those characteristics. So they may be interested in just getting access to very large storage or very large memory spaces. Or they may be interested in getting high performance, persistent data storage or doing both indeed. Um, and it's always all the other thing that it's worth um, remembering about these devices, of course, is they're a little bit more complicated than standard um, storage, so, sorry, standard memory, standard DRAM. Um, so they have these built in um, controls on each of the DIMMs, uh, which take care of writing the data to the hardware and reading the data from the hardware, but also some other functions which are important if your data persists on memory, uh, particularly in encryption, so that you can leave your data in the memory. OK, it'll still be there when the computer to turn back on, but you can encrypt it to some level so that only you can read the data or only whoever has the keys can read the data. And indeed, you can configure it in such a way that when you reboot the computer, a new key is generated. So data that was there before is, is automatically uh, unreadable uh, and that's possible as well so depending on how you are running your system you could make it secure in the sense that you run your job uh, your job finishes and someone else's job's coming on you can you can actually make sure no one else can access the data you've written there so it's set up for a, a wide range of different use cases from people single user nodes where you want to store your data but you don't want someone to be able to steal the dims and get access to your data just like you would have with a a hard drive or an SSD, so it's encrypted, up to um, sharing compute nodes between different users and ensuring that each user has data is, is uh, encrypted uh, and uh, kept secure. Uh, and just to emphasize the point, you know, what we're talking about here is not external storage devices, not external I.O. devices, but uh, memory which is sitting within the standard memory channels connected directly to the processor. So this picture on the left hand side is a picture of one of our compute nodes um, on our prototype system which has got two processors which are the two silver blocks with uh, yellow circles on them and then each of those processors has uh, 12 DIMMs of normal memory and 12 DIMMs of this non-volatile or byte addressable persistent memory. Uh, and actually, the DIMMs that we saw in the previous slide, these kind of DIMMs here, are the yellow DIMMs with the white labels and the barcodes on them in uh, the memory channels. And next to each one of those is a normal DRAM DIMM um, as well. So we can see that we actually have the storage here. We've got 12 storage DIMMs, 12 non-volatile DIMMs, and 12 RAM DIMMs, uh, DRAM DIMMs connected to the same uh, motherboard. Uh, and so that's the difference with this kind of storage. You can also take the same hardware, so the same underlying hardware that is being used to build the memory on these DIMMs, 
and put it into a, a hard disk, into an SSD, into a NVMe drive. So it's a non-volatile memory drive attached over PCI Express to the processor. And you can use that large capacity and persistence there. But the difference here is that we're looking at memory, which is directly attached to processor um, processors and processor memory controllers. So we can access it that way. Uh, so in general, the opt-in, Intel opt-in DIMMs are much larger capacity than the standard memory. So as we've seen before, you, at the moment you get them in 128 gigabytes, 256 gigabytes and 512 gigabyte DIMMs. And that means you can put up to 12, uh, up to six terabytes in a single node quite easily, in a single dual processor node quite easily. And of course, it's not doesn't have quite the same performance as normal um, RAM, as normal DDR4 DRAM. So uh, from our experience, reading data from it is about three times as slow as going to normal memory, into volatile memory. And writing data to it is about seven times slower than going to normal data. Now, these numbers will change depending on your access patterns. But this is for writing reasonable amounts of data that's contiguous okay if you were looking at non-contiguous data where you're taking small bits of data um, and then skip into another piece in memory then you know it may be slightly slower or slightly faster depending on what you're doing but this is a sort of level um, we're, we're looking at so it's slower to use than, than, than normal memory and it's actually slower to write than it is to read and that's just to do with how the hardware works um, the other slight funny issue with that is that writing is done on on these 256 byte chunks so if you're writing uh, chunks of four double precision numbers you'll get sort of the best write performance if you're only writing one double precision number and moving somewhere else in memory then you may see a slightly reduced performance as well but that's quite a nice uh, granularity compared to traditional IO where you're looking at doing you know, four thousand ninety-six kilobyte blocks, or, or or something bigger than that, uh, and that's a, a traditional file read and write. I don't know on on blocks, but much much bigger blocks. The other thing that we that I mentioned last week uh, was that because now we're putting the memory in memory channels, uh, then we can also run into the same non-uniform memory access cost issues that you get with with volatile memory with DRAM um, when if you're populating a multiprocessor system with this kind of memory. So for our prototype we have two processors in a node. Each processor has um, 96 gigabytes of volatile memory and 1.5 terabytes of non-volatile memory. So the whole node has 192 gigabytes of volatile memory and three terabytes of non-volatile memory but the memory as we saw in this picture here is attached to particular processors so accessing memory from one processor which is physically attached to the other processor is slower than accessing memory which is local and, and this is nothing new for high performance computing we've seen similar things for normal memory access for a long time now but it's just something that's been aware of to be aware of so if we were to run you know fully populated nodes that which means that 48 cores in my nodes i run 48 processes on that node uh, and i try to access only the non-volatile memory attached to one processor then i would see some performance reduction um about i would get about half the read performance and about a quarter of the write performance i could if instead i was targeting the memory which is directly attached to a processor which I'm running on. Um, and so there's some performance penalties be, to be encountered if you don't program in a way that respects this non-uniform memory access cost and, and, and understands where hardware is located and which hardware is the most sensible to, to locate. And um, uh, the nice thing is you can quite easily program a little bit of code which looks up, okay, which processor am I running on? Okay, how do I access the memory which is attached to that processor? Okay, give me the memory which is 
the closest to me and will be the fastest. So it's very possible in your code to write a couple of little functions or subroutines which does this uh, non-uniform memory access placement for you but um, you need to be able to be aware of that and be able to put that in your program to get the best performance. Now you'll still get correctness, you'll still get um, good performance, you just won't get the best performance unless you, you res re re uh, respect this memory locality issues. Uh, and just a, a, a brief aside, it's also worth remembering that this type of non-volatile memory differs from normal and uh, non-volatile memory, so sort of from normal SSDs or what people would call NAND flash or 3D NAND flash, not only because of its performance but because of its endurance as well. So it uh, has a much higher endurance to reads and writes uh, before it breaks than, than other non-volatile memory technology, which means it's suitable to, to be put in, for, the, for putting into a sort of memory system like we're doing here. And why are we interested in this? Well, we're interested in this because we can get a much higher read and write data performance for applications. So here uh, I'm presenting some results from a, this is now a traditional I.O. benchmark which uses files. And so not necessarily you, the most efficient way of using this memory, but we're using files here um, and I'm comparing it to a, a traditional parallel file system attached to our prototype, a luster file system. Now it's not a particularly high performance luster file system, but it's just worth uh, demonstrating the sort of performance differential here. So um, we can see that the read and the write performance, of course, is different for our non-volatile memory, which is listed on this picture as something called FSDAX. And that's the kind of file system we set up on the non-volatile memory for it to use. And we can see that you know the read and the write is about you know two to four times performance difference between read and write. So we get a higher read performance than we do a write performance. Uh, but we can see also that we get um, a couple of orders of magnitude higher performance from this non-volatile memory than we do from the Lustre file system, uh, particularly when we scale up to large numbers of parallel processors. So we can easily be reading and writing, so reading about 1.82 terabytes of data a second and writing about three or 400 gigabytes of data a second uh, when we're using all the nodes compared to a Lustre file system where we get about you know 10 or 20 gigabytes a second at, at most. And that's the kind of performance benefits that we are interested in. Uh, but of course, it's also worth bearing in mind that one of the performance benefits of using this kind of memory is, is that it's not a storage device and it don't have to access it using the file uh, APIs, using the file reads and writes. And if you remember what I said last week, uh, file I.O. is expensive because it requires you to do I.O. in large blocks um, because that's the way the operating system is set up to do it. Uh, and that's, that's also is expensive because you have to do I.O. through the operating system. The operating system is controlling this device, hard disk drive or SSD or NVMe device you've got attached. So when you do file I.O. you have to ask the operating system to do it for you and then you have to give it a large chunk of data and it copies it off or it copies the data from the device if you're reading. Um, the nice thing about this non-volatile memory is we can avoid that altogether. We can just say get a memory address that's on this data, on this hardware, and then just use it as normal in my program. So we can bypass the OS kernel faults and the block-based I.O. We can access at a byte level, or at least a cache line level data. So we can access small amounts of data. And crucially, it gives us high performance for small reads and small writes. Um, so, um, the, uh, and this um, graph here is sort of designed to highlight this. So if I am a reading and writing data in large blocks, so here I'm reading or writing four megabytes of data at a time, and I use the non-volatile memory, and I can use it in two different ways. I can use it as a file system where I'm reading and writing files through the, through the kernel and, and in these large chunks. That, that's what I've called FSDAX here. 
or I can program it directly so I'm using the, the hardware as memory and I'm accessing the memory directly I'm not opening and closing files and, and f writing and f reading or whatever you use to, to do your file I.O. Uh, and that there I'm using the PMDK library which we introduced last week and we can see that these large block sizes actually using files is gives you very you know almost exactly the same performance as using this as is using this programmable memory functionality using this PMDK functionality um, however if we change the amount of data we're reading and writing then it does going through that file that FSDAX approach going for a file approach really does have a very big performance impact if we only want to do small amounts of read or write uh, whereas the PMDK approach where we can program the we can uh, move data in and out of the hardware as if it was uh, memory uh, we don't see the same performance uh, issues so this graph here is for reading data from the non-volatile memory and on the left we're using the non-volatile memory um, for a file system and we're using standard file IO to read it and we can see that the read bandwidth for anything below about um, 16 32 kilobyte blocks so large chunks of data is very poor whereas on the right hand side when we're using PMDK and using it as memory we can get the same read bandwidth for 128 bytes or 256 bytes really as we can for 32 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes so the the uh, PMDK approach the programming memory approach that, that, um, that we were discussing last week really gives us um, extremely good performance for very small data operations as well as for large data operations and that means that we have some storage now here which we can use for very large data movements or very small data movements as efficiently uh, and so that's for read data the, for write data we see exactly the same thing except the bandwidth is lower because the, the write is slower than the read so we can see the bandwidth here is somewhere between the sort of um, four to six times slower than read but again we can see that using the files uh, on the left hand side we get very poor performance until we start using something like 32 kilobyte chunks whereas on the right hand side using the programming memory approach we get the best performance when we're spending small amounts of data 256 bytes 512 byte chunks uh, written to the, the hardware but we see very consistently good performance you know as good as the file I/O across a whole range of different uh, data access sizes and so that's the real for me anyway that's the real uh, uh, key benefit for this kind of hardware the fact that we can have this storage long term of data this persistent data but we can access small chunks of it efficiently compared to any other way of, of accessing our data and so this is why I think it's important to be able to program this directly in your application rather than use other approaches to, to program it such as use it as files um, or, or use it as a database because all of us are going to you know, encounter those costs associated with, associated with small data movements and, and operating system overheads that we can bypass if we program this directly uh, the uh, other way that we discussed that you could use this is, is just use it as very large memory space and so uh, just as a quick reminder um, it's definitely possible uh, through the Intel hardware to set up this thing called memory mode where you don't have to program it directly you don't get to to leverage this persistent functionality but you get a very large memory space so on our system you can say if we configure it correctly get three terabytes of main memory at a performance which is generally about 10 percent slower than DRAM but but around D DRAM uh, performance levels so so that we can see as being another nice use case of this but it's not really using the non-volatile or the persistent functionality of this 
a bit hard to wear uh, at all. And uh, the last thing we finished talking about last week was, you know, how, okay, so you've said that programming this persistent memory directly is a beneficial thing to do. How do you actually go about it? Well, uh, there's this PMDK library, which is developed by Intel and others, um, and it gives you a, a PMAP component um, which uh, allows you to program the hardware directly in the same way that you would have done memory mapping files. You may have done memory mapping files previously on Linux. Effectively, you can say, uh, give me a file, map it into the memory, but here we're mapping it onto the persistent memory. And then from that, you just get a, a pointer, a, a memory address, which you can then use in your program. And so here's an example of me doing a triad from the streams benchmark. I open up a memory space, I get a single pointer back, and then I work out, okay, my array A starts here, my array B starts there, my array C starts here. Uh, and then from there, I can just use A, B, and C as if they were arrays. And they're writing directly or reading directly to and from the non-volatile memory through the general cache hierarchies that we have on these kinds of um, hardware. Uh, um, now, the only caveat to that is if you want to make sure your data does end up stored on that hardware long term, um, even in the event of power failures or things like that, then there's a function you have to use called pmem persist, which will take your data and flush it out of the CPU caches and make sure it's arrived at the non volatile memory and has been stored there. And then after that, you, you can be happy that it's there and it's safe to, to leave and safe to switch off the computer when it's safe to move on. So that's what we talked about um, last week. Now, uh, there are, um, of course, other ways um, to do this. Uh, and a lot of people would um, suggest that actually um, programming using PMEM directly, using the PMEM li the library directly, is a bit low level for um, a lot of applications. Um, and that's because um, it is making a lot of the um, difficulties of programming this memory your responsibility as a programmer. Um, so the PMM functionality gives you the lowest level support. It lets you access the memory directly, but it's your responsibility as a programmer to make sure that data is in a consistent state and data is in a safe state. And if you get that wrong, well, if things go wrong, it's your fault. It's, you know, the hardware will not give you any support there. The operating system won't give you any support there. It's up to you to call the PMM persist at the right time, to have multiple versions of your data stored in different places so you can access them uh, so you can flip between them these kind of things and um, so for a lot of programs um, there is higher level functionality in the pmdk library which may be beneficial to use rather than to program the persistent memory um, directly yourselves um, and so i think for you know for a lot of uh, developers, this is a sensible thing to do. Now, I think for uh, people who are developing computational science, uh, machine learning kind of applications, it may be that you want to go to its lowest level PMEM library because it gives you direct control of the memory. And that's what you're used to having for a lot of you know, C programs or uh, even Fortran programs for high performance computing. So that's why we sort of teach that th first, because I think whilst for a lot of the programming community using PMEM might be too low level for the kind of use cases we have for high performance computing um, using the PMEM libraries is probably sensible uh, but also there are these higher level uh, persistent memory programming approaches which you could use instead and effectively they are things that themselves use PMEM underneath, but have wrapped PMEM up in safety um, code and in uh, functional uh, libraries. So you can ask for objects or you can do transactions so that you can say, 
okay here's some data i want to make sure it's on the persistent memory but but if it doesn't get there let me roll that back so that I, i'm in a consistent state and so there you can imagine if you are writing a database or, or a file system these are the kind of things that you definitely want to be able to use because you are more concerned with ensuring your data is correct than having the, the most high performance uh, functionality that is available so um, PMDK library, it provides the PBEM approach, which we've already talked about, uh, but it also provides um, some other stuff in there, some higher level stuff, transactional memory, key value stores, and memory pools, uh, and, and various other bits and bobs, but, but, but that's the majority of it, which take away some of the complexity in, in understanding and managing persistent memory for you, and let you program without having to worry that you're program is going to be correct in the way it stores data. So these can be um, useful approaches. Um, so uh, one of the, so these are libpmemobj, libpmemblock, libpmemlog, and pmkv. And these are sort of four different libraries within the PMDK suite of libraries which give you different ways of using the persistent memory. libpmemobj is a transactional object store which creates memory for you, gives you a transaction for storing data into an object store and gives you a transaction for loading data from the object store so that you can be sure that once the data has gone into the object store it's correct and when you're updating the data, once it's told you it's updated, that has been persisted. And if it hasn't told you it's been updated and something goes wrong, you can roll back to the old version of that data. Um, pools, PMEM block um, will give you uh, blocks of PMEM, so chunks of the persistent memory, rather than individual uh, bytes, but chunks of them, um, which you can atomically update. So you can say, okay, update all these values inside a chunk and make sure they're all updated or none of them are updated. So again, it gives you a sort of transactional functionality. So you can say, take this data, store it all at once. If, it's, if it succeeds, it's all stored. If it fails, none of it's stored. But we never end up with a block which is half updated and half not updated. Um, and then there's uh, PMEM. Uh, libpmemlog which is a similar kind of thing but designed for log files so instead of arbitrary blocks which can be updated it is sort of appending data to the end of a log and making sure that those appends are done uh, atomically as well and then there is a pmemkv a key, uh, key value store which is very like the object store but gives you more functionality to, to define you know how you structure your keys and your values and your and, and the store itself. Uh, and the nice thing is that of course that the uh, PMEM library gives you a, a set of um, language bindings for some of these things as well, so that you don't have to just be doing <coughs> the low-level C API, which is the PMEM API. So uh, we can see that we're here we've got the PMEM KV library key value store it itself builds on top of the libpmemobj um, library but it gives you c++ javascript java ruby and c bindings to let you in to give you a functionality to call this from a bunch of different um, a bunch of different programming languages so pmemkv uh, effectively gives you a quite a simple storage engine which lets you start and stop the store the key value store put data into the key value store room, uh, look up data in the key value store and then sort of delete and check for so remove and and check that data is in the store and then it also will give you a set of iterators so you can say for each entry in this um, uh, key value store do something uh, so what does that look like? Well, if we look at the sort of C or the C++, C++ interface to that, we can specify 
that we want to create a, a key key value engine, give it a name, um, and tell it where to store that data. Um, so here we store it in slash dev slash shared memory. So this is volatile, but I could change that to slash mount slash um, fs dax zero, and that would put it on the pmem. Put it, put it on the non-volatile memory. And then I can put data into that, get data out of that, and remove data from that. So uh, we can see that it gives you a, sort of a, a way to store arbitrary data on volatile and non-volatile memory, uh, and then easily manage that um, data for us. Uh, the one of the nice things about it is it actually has a bunch of different storage engines. Um, so um, for different applications, some of these storage engines will be more or less useful, or more or less performant, I should say. Um, and it's possible for you to write your own storage engines to to, um, to leverage here. So you know whether you want access to the store, the key value store from multiple threads or multiple processes. You know, is it concurrent or not? Does having it sorted make a difference to your performance? Uh, and and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the, the highest level functionality, I would say. It's a simple um, but effective key value store, which you could use from in, in your application. Now, of course, it depends on your application being amenable to using this kind of this kind of storage. You can imagine if you were writing a simple um, linear algebra code, then you wouldn't want to be getting a, your each of your array elements out of a out of a key value store like this. Uh, whereas if you're looking to store unstructured data and, and then search for unstructured data um, for uh, data mining or machine learning, you could imagine the key value engine would give you a lot of functionality that you'd have to implement yourself um, to do those kind of functions. At a slightly lower level, there's libpmemobj, which if we can remember, um, is used by the key value store. Um, so it is the way of creating objects um, with transactions that you could, so if you don't want to use a key value store, but you still want to be able to create objects and make sure that they're consistent, or if a key, key value store is not structured in the, in the way that would be useful for your application, then there's, there's this libpmemobj, which gives you an object store with transactions so you can create and manage persistent memory uh, and add and move, remove data from that, from that uh, memory. Um, and it looks pretty similar to, in some ways to, to the key value store, um, but, we, but, it, but it has sort of more low level functionality for you to control um, exactly how the object store is, is created and used. So here we have a PM object open, so you can open an object store, and then you just give it a file path. And if the file is on persistent memory, then it will be using the non-volatile memory efficiently. And if not, then it will work uh, from standard file systems, but you just won't get the, the same performance. So you can open and close these uh, PMEM uh, object stores. Um, you can find the, the root entry. And then you can do a bunch of transactional um, uh, operations or, or some direct access to the memory store. So you can do a pmemobj tx add range, which is so say uh, for the object store, do a transaction transactional add um, and uh, a transactional free or an allocate or, or a range in a direct and um, so the one thing it may, it may be worth pointing out here is that the lib pmem obj gives you sort of two sets of functionality one to do um uh, adds and, and removes and, and allocates and deallocates using the object store that you've created this pmem oid uh, but you can also bypass that if you want to be a bit faster um, and pass it directly a memory address if you're sure that this object store is on persistent memory and can be accessed in a persistent memory way then you can bypass 
some of the objects to look up and say, look here, I knew, I know where this object that is already, um, and go directly in there. <clears throat> and we can also see that you know it gives allocate and free functionality, so that we can move, uh, so we can create our own object stores with varying kinds of objects in them. All we have to do to create an object is to know how much memory it will consume, how much memory it will take up. Um, and all we need to do to access objects is to know where they're located or to know their, to know their name to look them up. Um, and we can also use some of this functionality to define our own transactions, to define our own transactional logic for any kind of work we're wanting to do. So it gives you a set of macros here, uh, the TX begin, TX on commit, TX on abort, TX find, the TX end, end, which let you uh, um, create, well, take an object, either either create an object or, or take an object out of the object store, um, do some work on it, try and commit it. If a commit goes wrong, uh, run some code. Once a commit is finished, run some code, and 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 so on and so forth. So this lets us write our own logic to, or lets people write their own logic to storing data or modifying data in the object store, uh, and then taking uh, particular actions if a data commit happens, and if there's a failure or something like that, you can come back and roll it back to a consistent state and retry it or, or abandon it, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you have functionality requirements which are a bit more rich and varied than a traditional key value store will support, then the libpmem obj stuff will um, definitely um, provide the functionality you know, to write that kind of uh, uh, code. And there's also, as I said uh, previously, uh, a bunch of uh, different language bindings for some of this stuff. Um, but we can see that the, the macros defined here uh, would work in something like C and, and, and potentially other languages, but there are also direct C++ interfaces and, and other interfaces. But here we have an equivalent C++ interface um, for doing a push and pop and um, transactional um, functionality within the, the object store. Uh, even more sort of um, low level um, uh, will be uh, is libpmem block, which is designed to get to let you create an array of blocks all of the same size, and then do function do updates and uh, edits of those blocks, uh, where updates and edits are atomic. I e they either happen and the whole block is updated or they don't happen and everything is as if it hadn't been uh, updated before. Um, and of course, this is particularly useful for people who are writing file systems or databases because quite often, you know, file systems are built from uh, blocks of data which are uh, chained together to give you files um, and file spaces. So this is sort of one of the lower level building blocks of um, the PMTK library. Uh, but, but useful to people who are writing their own persistent memory file systems or pers persistent memory databases. Uh, and it's pretty st um, similar in a lot of ways to the pmem approach in that you create um, like a, a, a block uh, array, just like we would map a file for the pmem approach, um, and we can open that block array and then we can create a set of, um, uh, we can find out how many blocks are in the array, we can write to a particular block, we can read from a particular block, we can close the, the block array, we can add blocks, we can remove blocks. <clears throat> so it gives you the functionality to create a, a sort of set of a chain of <clears throat> data entries where the data entries don't have to be a single uh, item, they can be chunks of, chunks of items, you know, uh, and you can be sure that your updates are consistent for those items. 
Um, and in a similar uh, vein, there is PMEM log, <clears throat> which lets you create into the, an array of blocks a set a log file. So you can think of it as just a file, um, and you can create it, you can open it, and then you can add things to the end of it. And you've got functionality to to iterate through the log and see what's happened. Now, of course, this again is designed for people who are trying to who are interested in building their own file systems or their own um, file uh, storage types or, or data storage types, because uh, a lot of modern file systems are built on this idea of uh, append only uh, file systems where you create a bit of data and then if it's updated, you don't change that data. You just you add a new version on, or you, or you add a different a different uh, you, you uh, summarize the differences between the two versions, and so on and so forth. So you never end up updating data which has been stored on the on the, in the file or in the log file. You just end up adding to it over time, and then you can go back and create a consistent version of a file for different snapshots in time. So here we can see this functionality is uh, particularly useful for um, creating versioned data where we want to update the file, but we want to be able to possibly go back to a previous version of a file or update some data or, and then go back to some previous version of the data. Uh, and the functionality is provided in the library using pmem log uh, append or pmem log walk to add things to this file or to go back and go forward in, in, in time effectively in this, in this file and um, update and, and uh, uh, find data that has been stored um, or there before so you can retrieve or you can update uh, the data. Um, so that is the um, the majority of the higher level functionality in the um, PMEM uh, well, the PMDK library. <clears throat> now, it's not the only way to use this um, non volatile memory and a higher level capacity, but it is the kind of you know, higher level programming um, methods which are currently available uh, through PMDK, which you could use <clears throat> to undertake your. Um, application or to uh, let you leverage persistent memory without you having to directly uh, access the raw memory <clears throat> and make sure you have to ensure your persists um, are correct and your, your data is consistent. Um, now, uh, what we will um, <clears throat> discuss um, after a break, uh, <clears throat> even higher levels of ways of doing this. Um, which maybe don't involve programming at all, or maybe involve using other tools. Um, but these are the, the levels of, of programming which which uh, <clears throat> may be useful to application developers um, at the moment. There are, of course, uh, even more basic ways of using this non-volatile memory. <clears throat> uh, and as we discussed last week, the, the simplest way is just to use it as a file system. So there's nothing to stop <clears throat> stop you just reading and writing data to files and getting a good performance from a non-volatile memory. Um, and as we demonstrated before, actually, if you're reading and writing data in large block sizes, it's likely, you know, very large block sizes, 32 kilobyte chunks or, or, or higher. But it's likely you actually you'll get the good performance out of this hardware, uh, regardless of which way you program it, because the um, overheads of, of reading and writing data through the file system are, are uh, mitigated if you go up to large enough chunks uh, sizes, because uh, the operating system can do things like prefetch and preload and, and uh, caching of data. So. If you're taking an application and actually uh, you know it already does quite good I.O. and you just want to improve that I.O., then the file system is, of course, one way to do that. And then, of course, my argument is that um, being able to read and write data in smaller chunks in, in, in you know, individual bytes or at least cache lines 
uh, at high performance is, is let's us uh, do some functionality, let's us restructure our programs a little bit um, compared to what we could have done before. Um, and so there are some real benefits from going down to a position level memory approach, PM, PMDK, persistent memory approach. Um, and then there are also if what you're interested in is not necessarily high just high performance, but high performance and um, safe uh, storage of long term storage of data, then some of these slightly higher level approaches we've discussed just now, uh, presented just now, such as the transactional stuff, the key value st stores, um, uh, the object stores, maybe a safer way of doing your programming because it gives you uh, persistent guarantees um, and it will let you rebuild your data if something goes wrong compared to if you're doing it yourself when it's up to you to make sure that you have uh, at the correct time made sure that your data has reached the hardware uh, in a cons consistent state and that's sort of a hard thing from a correctness point of view to do if you're doing direct persistent memory programming which these are higher level libraries um, spend uh, some effort to overcome for you um, of course with a caveat that it will impact performance because it may be that you don't get the highest direct memory performance if you're using a key value score or, or an object store or some kind of log file or an array of uh, blocks um, so those are the different flavors of programming that we can do on the hardware at the moment um, and that's all I wanted to say on that uh, particular lecture I've finished a couple of minutes early uh, but the plan um, uh, now was to take a break between now and half past three here half past four in Europe of course um, and then I would come back and uh, talk a little bit more than in depth about okay and um, what are the kind of things that you need to consider particularly for your application um, and what are the uh, other applications out there that are using persistent memory so uh, what are the high level frameworks that let you exploit persistent memory without you having to program at all um, things like uh, Intel's DAOs object store or, or data clay um, so I'm quite happy to take any questions anybody has um, just now uh, but if not we'll take a break now we'll come back in in 40 minutes and pick up the, the, the next lecture last next and last lecture um, and of course feel free at any point uh, now or over next week to play around with the hardware and have a look at the exercises um, as outlined in the exercise sheet on the website um, and using the prototype where you should have um, access to the, the hardware through a, for an email from me uh, and if you have any questions about the exercises or any issues of that um, uh, feel free to get in touch uh, either now or later um, uh, about that okay so I'll get started again um, and, and give the last couple of lectures um, basically thinking a little bit more about the design side of, of hardware or of programs programming non volatile memory and then some of the other ways that uh, people I I exploit it um, and really they're sort of looking at the wider implications of including persistent memory in, in uh, high performance computing systems at a node level so looking at going beyond a single node and what are the implications when you go to multiple nodes and, and what tools or or bits of software are out there that let you exploit multiple nodes worth of, of non-volatile memory because um, as we'll come on to see there are some potentially uh, nice performance benefits from going to multi-node um, non-volatile memory uh, functionality so, um, so uh, but I think one of the important things about the persistent memory or non-volatile memory programming really is, is the design and thinking about the design of, of applications to exploit it because of, as I've already said um, actually creating 
uh, data structures on non-volatile memory and storing them there is not particularly hard. Uh, it does doesn't particularly if you're a C C++ programmer, it does not involve much change of applications in the first instance. But of course, um, in, ensuring that your program is correct with persistent memory may require some design functionality um, and may require some rethinking of, of application design and also getting the best performance or, or make, making the best use of an unvolatile memory may require something about how designs how your program design should should could or should change and now none of this is particularly complicated or none of this is really rocket science but there are again two sort of key aspects to this here one is the persistence of your data and if that's what you care about if you care that your data should be stored safely um, for reuse later then you need to care about the persistence of it um, and then the other thing is are there ways you could change your program to better use this memory because your program has been written in such a way that you do lots of you know large reads and writes and maybe you could cut that down and do smaller numbers of reads and writes etc um, so in terms of thinking about the persistency uh, what I like to think of is in terms of a persistent window so a window of persistency um, as in how, how uh, what sort of spread of time in your program um, is your data volatile in it and when does it need to become persistent and so here what we're talking about is you know how long can your program operate with you uh, unconcerned whether your data has reached it reached the hardware and is finally persistent um, uh, and then when do you care when you when in your program do you care that your data has got there uh, and this is because clearly for a persistent application for an application that cares about the data being stored uh, safely and carefully um, what you're worried about is that at any point your program could fail we fail because the machine fails it could fail because because something else goes wrong and if you're in a persistent if you're in a in a place in your program where you've not done anything about persistency then when it fails uh, uh, your data may be in an inconsistent state okay so um, for correctness sake you may care about when you load data uh, from persistent memory or store data to persistent memory when you change that data and then when you finally decide just to make sure that data is persistent using the pmem persist or pmem flush pmem drain functions that we discussed um, last week uh, now for a lot of applications uh, they may not care at all you may not care about persistence at all uh, you know for instance if you write an application nowadays to use normal memories use DRAM and your program crashes halfway through well the data that was in the DRAM is gone when you reload your program up you load in new data um, you get going again um, and that's perfectly fine you just ignore the fact that you used to have data your machine crashed you lost the data it was volatile and, and it's gone and you can treat persistent memory in that way that's perfectly fine uh, the only thing that you have to consider is that you know if you're loading data from persistent memory and treating it as if it was volatile and um, then it may be in an inconsistent state if your computer does crash you know uh, so if you load it up and don't load it up into a new data structure but keeping it in its existing data structure which is already on the non-volatile memory and then make modifications to it uh, with the uh, hope that in the future you'll store it back to that non-volatile data you could end up with an inconsistent state there and so that's much more about thinking about you know what's your initial um, data for your application where is that stored and then when you load that into uh, to, to memory um, where is it stored in memory and where are you making your updates now one of the nice things about the 
for non-volatile memory, one of the benefits of a non-volatile memory is that it gives you a place. You, you don't have to have your initial data stored on disk and then load it into main memory, into DRAM, and store it there as well. So you've got two copies, one on disk and one on DRAM. Do all your work in DRAM and then save your results at the end out to a file, which is what we traditionally do for for uh, programs at the moment. Because we can have that file, that data stored on the non-volatile memory, then we don't have to load it into memory. We can just leave it in the non-volatile memory and access it directly, get our initial data directly from the non-volatile memory do all our work we want, either in DRAM or non-volatile memory, and then in the end, just make sure our data ends up in the, in the correct place, in the correct place in non-volatile memory or the correct place on a file somewhere else. But we just need to make sure then, updating the initial data um, in such a way that if, if a crash occurs, we could end up with a inconsistent state, so our initial data is then corrupted. It's no longer initial data; it's somewhere between initial data and updated data, uh, and that's particularly um, difficult to do from a um, conceptual point of view because we we need to use these um, functions: this pmem persist function, or this pmem flush pmem drain functions. With so pmem persist, if you if you can remember from last week was a function call from the PMDK PMM library. And it makes sure your data is flushed out of the CPU caches and then drained from the um, memory controller on the non-volatile memory into the hardware. Um, and so PMM persist under the hood. things up. But the, the thing to be aware of, of course, is that none of these functions are atomic either or transactional. So that if you call pmem persist, um, you're only sure that your data has actually got to the hardware once pmem persist has finished and returned and your program can move on. So your the program, if, if a power failure happens in the middle of pmem persist, then you don't know what state it's in. If a power failure happens before pmem persists, you don't know what, what state you're in there either as well. So it's only after you've called this function um, that you uh, know that your data is safely stored um, in its final form on the uh, hardware. Now, it may have been stored to the hardware before you call pmem persist, but you don't know until you, until you uh, call this functionality. Um, but of course, calling the persist functionality is expensive. You know, flushing the CPU caches, waiting for the data to get to the uh, non-volatile memory, which is slower than RAM, which is in turn slower than uh, main memory uh, from the processor, uh, means that you are potentially have to wait quite a long time for that pmem persist function, um, depending on how much data your system um, to complete. And so because you've got to wait a long time for uh, PMEM persists, you don't want to be calling it any more times than you need to. Um, so that's why you don't add PMEM persist everywhere you update a, a non volatile memory variable because it would be expensive to do such a thing. So this is why we think in terms of persistent windows, as in, or, or maybe I should really call this as a non persistent windows, but you know. I've modified the data here. I've modified large amounts of the data between this point and this point, And I know that they will not guarantee to have got back to the hardware until I call pmem persist. Is that OK for my program or not? Uh, now, of course, as we've already mentioned, um, there is a, a real a uh, use case for uh, non-volatile memory for this what I call byte addressable persistent memory or this non-volatile um, persistent memory uh, where you don't care about persistence at all you just care about the large memory capacity so you're only using it because you can still large you could read and write large amounts of data um, on the on a compute node so I can write six terabytes of or read six terabytes of uh, memory 
on a compute mode rather than a, a smaller amount with volatile memory or, or because it's cheaper to to get this non-volatile memory than it is to get it as much um, uh, volatile memory as you require for the job you're doing and that's perfectly fine if that's the case then you're just using the persistent memory um, as volatile as in you're just using it as if it was normal DRAM and if your program crashes you just have to restart from the beginning uh, and you've lost your data that's perfectly fine so you can simply use a um, uh, opt-in memory as then if it is if it was DRAM you don't have to put the persist calls in um, there is a little bit of cleanup you need to do with it because it uses memory map file functionality to create your arrays for you um, then um, once your program's finished you need to delete those memory maps files because otherwise they'll take up space on the opt-in memory and uh, you'll end up running out of space on the opt-in memory so they're not automatically cleaned for you like uh, DRAM effectively is um, so uh, you do need to do that um, and of course you have to be aware of performance issues if you're using this opt-in memory as, as, as a, a large memory space for your program uh, in that uh, as we've already seen uh, write is slower than read uh, and both write and read are slower than write and read for DRAM so you know if you were just going to use it in, in no DRAM at all for all your writes and your, and your program does lots of writing uh, data then it's going to be slower than if you were using normal uh, DRAM uh, in your, and it could be anywhere up to sort of seven, eight, nine times slower uh, than using DRAM. Uh, of course, it's it's much faster than if you were doing reads and writes to files, uh, but that may be not be um, important to you because it's the, the DRAM performance that you're seeing. Um, so uh, there is also a consideration there that um we want to um be careful about um how we do our writes because we have this hardware which co coalesces 256 byte um writes then uh, making sure we do writes of a of a, a sort of a reasonable size for this uh, not, not not too large but you know um uh, writing 256 bl byte blocks or you know writing four double precision numbers or eight double precision numbers together is likely to give you better performance than writing one double position number at once. Um, um, so, you know, this is an example here of a bit of uh, code we actually used to teach uh, on our MSC. It's a, it's a very simple computational simulation application which, which sharpens an image. It's a convolution kernel. Uh, and it takes like the image on the left and creates the image on the right. Uh, but it's nice because it's, it's easily parallelizable and easily implemented um, uh, but this is the the, the core uh, computational kernel here and if I'm just wanting to use the persistent memory here um, to give me a to be able to store large amounts of data um, uh, there's obviously different places I can use this here so I can see I've got three well I've got two main data structures here I've got convolutional par partial and I've got fuzzy padded. These are my two uh, data arrays here. And effectively, fuzzy padded holds the original image, the image on the left hand side, and then convolutional partial holds the data I'm updating to produce the new image. And so here I've got quite a nice access pattern where fuzzy padded is um, as big or bigger than the convolutional partial array. Um, uh, but I never write to it, I only ever read from it. And convolutional partial, I read from and I write to, uh, and that will be my final output. So what I can actually do for this kind of application is I can take the fuzzy padded and I can put that into the non-volatile memory. And I can leave the convolutional partial in volatile memory in DRAM. Okay, and then I can run my application. I'll only ever be reading from the non-volatile memory, so actually I don't have to worry about persistence at all because I'm never changing my data on the non-volatile memory. So I don't have to worry, you know, when these updates going to happen and is, it, is data still in the volatile CPU caches? Have it been flushed out? All these kind of things. And I also know that reading data is fast. It's the fastest 
form of data access of a non-volatile memory, so I should get good performance here. Um, my convolutional partial, I still need on the non-volatile on the volatile memory, um, and it, it will be accessed as, exactly as it was before. Of course, if my program crashes at any point, uh, then I will have to go back to the beginning and recompute convolutional partial because I have not stored any part of it on the persistent memory, so I can't resume. I've got no checkpoint in here or anything like that. So here I can quite easily take fuzzy padded, turn it into a non-volatile memory array, leave convolutional partial as a volatile memory array, and actually I can halve the amount of volatile memory I need by using a non-volatile memory. And if I benchmark this, then actually I, I get um, hardly, you know, um, not a significant performance impact from doing this. So I can use the slower non-volatile memory just as my uh, read data, but because it's passing through the CPU cache, like everything else, then it gets cached, uh, and I don't really see any performance uh, impacts from going out to the non-volatile memory. Um, and, and effectively, I've got you know half my uh, memory requirements now satisfied by the non-volatile memory. Um, I can reduce the amount of DRAM I need, uh, and I can still compute the, the data complete the algorithm in the, in the correct time. So if I if I can ignore those, you know, volat if I've got an algorithm which I can structure in such a way where I can bypass the issues of um, of uh, persisting and updating data, then I can potentially get some really quite nice benefits from using this non-volatile uh, memory. Uh, although, of course, I'm not using the persistence functionality of a memory. Um, I now. If I was to do the other way around and put convolutional partial on the non-volatile memory and fuzzy padded in the volatile memory, um, then I don't see the same performance characteristics. Actually, I see the program goes you know, two or three times slower. Uh, but I get, I do get the nice side effect that if my program crashed at any point, um, as long as I put a persist um, call in at the right place then I need to uh, then I then I would be able to resume um, from you know the, the previous iteration that had been persisted um, and I wouldn't lose any of my um, data that I'd computed up till now but it does cost me in terms of performance because I'm now using the non-volatile not not just for reading but also for writing data too um, and that has some performance impact on the on the program overall. Um, now, of course, that sounds uh, pretty straightforward, um, but unfortunately, because of the way that the non-volatile memory is accessed, um, even if I put a persist um, functionality, uh, you know, a PMEM persist call into my code, um, I'm not guaranteed that uh, if my um, code crashes, at any point, my data is in a consistent um, state. So if I just, uh, one second, I will just modify my um, file. If I just modify my file, uh, this, uh, sorry, this, this presentation, just to change the code slightly. And I'll put it back up. Uh, so if I put in here at the end, PMEM, Persist um, convolutional uh, partial, and then oh, what is it? N X times N Y. Let me share my screen again. So if I put this PMEM persist function at the bottom here after the loop, that will, after that PMEM persist call has happened, make sure that convolutional partial is correctly updated on the hardware. So after that's called, I know all the updates have made it to the hardware. Um, of course, um, any time before then, some of the updates may have made it to the hardware and some may not. So my convolutional partial could easily be in a a state which is, um, you know, 
similar it, it is half the old version and half the new version or some of the old version of a data and some of the new version of a data and that's the real challenge here and then if i you know go around this again um even though i've just done my pmem persists uh, in fact if i do an outer loop here Um, if I do an outer loop around this, so I do this convolutional partial multiple times, um, that same inconsistency state um, can easily happen again. So here I'm iterating around this outer loop. Um, so I'm doing my convolutional partial update 10 times for each pixel uh, and for each kernel in the pixel or each filter in the pixel. And at the end of each iteration, I um, persist my data. Um, this looks like it is um, uh, going to be correct, but uh, it isn't necessarily um, correct because every time you change the data, um, it's it, it, uh, potentially then the convolutional partial is not correctly updated on the non-volatile memory. So I've got an outer loop where in red here where I iterate over. Every time I call pmem persist here, once pmem persist has, uh, has occurred, I'm happy that convolutional partial is correctly updated but as soon as I go back round the loop again that convolutional partial as soon as I start updating any part of convolutional partial then my uh, storage my convolutional partial on the on the uh, non-volatile memory could be an inconsistent state because I could have changed you know 50 elements of it and 40 of them have been evicted from the cache and made them their way back to the non-volatile memory and 10 of them haven't um, and I don't know that until I call pmem persist. So actually the pmem persist guarantees that after I've called it and before I change convolutional partial again, it's correct. It's on the disk, it's on the disk, it's on the hardware, it's on the non-volatile memory in the correct format. But as soon as I change it again, it's, it's potentially in an inconsistent state. If I have a power failure, if I have something which causes my program to crash, if I have something which stops my program in program running, then I don't know what state that convolutional partial is on the storage. So if we're using the non-volatile memory to do any writing at all, then we we have to care about this. Um, as long as we you know don't want to lose data, or you know we're not happy to delete that data and start again if we uh, restart the simulation because something went wrong. Uh, and that means we either need to use some of this functionality that we've already seen in the higher level um, PMEM libraries, the transactional approaches, the object store, the key value stores, <clears throat> um, but uh, or we need to add some logic into our program ourselves um, to deal with it, which we'll talk about a little bit now. Um, the other side, the other aside. Uh, I should mention here, of course, is that all this persistent um, requirements that I'm talking about here are really focused on hardware failure where a node reboots, um, but but in general the hardware is intact and, 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 and functional. So power loss is really what I, our main focus is, is power loss, not not memory failure because all this persistence does is make sure that your data is stored on the hardware correctly if that memory dim then fails or is broken or someone steals it then it, you we don't have any resiliency of that data because the data is only stored in one place so if it's if you're interested in not only making sure your data is correctly stored in non-volatile memory but also make sure that it's resilient i.e. there are multiple copies in some way which you can recover from if, if one of them actually fails um, 
then you need to have a we need you would need to have a strategy to do some data replication uh, either in your application or using some tool um, because the non-volatile hardware doesn't do any of this there's no um, sort of software RAID or hardware RAID to copy data between non-volatile memory uh, DIMMs or between nodes um, there's no automatic redundancy for this, for this kind of functionality so that's another level of, of, of consistency that it may be worth considering um, anyway if we go back to the you know the persistent consistency um, there is so you if you're going to to write any data to non-volatile memory you need to think where am I going to put my persistent windows um, and what do I you know where are the places where I can deal with failure uh, between those persistent windows uh, it's always worth of course thinking about what you are if you have an existing application what you already do actually what are your what are your current strategies if you're writing data out to files and something fails do you have a strategy for you know recovering that file or not corrupting that file uh, because POSIX IO and, and parallel file systems um, don't necessarily ensure that data is in consistent states uh, even after you've called file write or file open or file close uh, data still could be cached in places so it's likely that most of your applications of standard IO that you're doing isn't really doesn't really require um, high levels of, of persistence um, correctness um, however if you're going to move to a more fine-grained um, approach to uh, storage or, or data uh, long-term persistence then that may become more of a problem for you so you may then care a bit more about making sure your persistent windows are correct um, what strategies are there for you to to sort of get around this um, uh, issue of data potentially being in an inconsistent state until you call pmem persist but be but calling pmem persist being expensive um, and, and uh, uh, damaging performance if you call it like for every element of a loop um, well the simplest uh, way is effectively just doubling up your data um, doubling up your storage so if you have an array where you're going to write to persistent memory and you're going to update those you know each element of the array um, and then you're going to persist it then it would be sensible to have two arrays uh, one of a previous um, iteration state um, which you're not going to update this time and then a new array which will update so that any time you're updating that until the point you call pmem persist if a failure happens you've not corrupted the old data and you can always go back to you resume from that old um, data in whatever form it's in okay and then once you've create once you've called pmem persist and that pmem persist has occurred then the new data becomes the uh, reference copy and you can switch back uh, to updating the old data and vice versa so you can effectively have a sort of double array approach where that any place you're going to update data you have two copies of that data any one time one which is correct and another one which is uh, new and being updated and once that's correctly persisted you can then switch over to updating the old, old one and this really um, will let you do very wide persistent windows uh, but of course at the expense of requiring large amounts of duplication of, of data so if you've got a, a million element array and you want to do your persist calls on that whole a million element array you'll need two million elements uh, of storage to be able to do that um, but that may be bend you know that may be perfectly acceptable the non-volatile memory is large uh, but this is one of the ways you could easily do it uh, and of course I mean the reason we're doing it is just to try and reduce that persistence cost reduce the cost of calling pmem persist um, by doing it as infrequently as possible it would be perfectly possible to just have you know a, a million element array and then one copy of a single variable if you're happy to update each variable in the array one at a time and then call persist on each element 
It's just that in practice, that tends to be quite an expensive way of doing it. So it may be nice to create wider persistent windows um, to allow you to um, update larger chunks of data before you have to call pmem persist uh, and thus by in thereby reducing the cost of persisting that data uh, uh, and in general it's pretty straightforward to do this in, in an application the 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 nasty thing about it of course is that it um, if you're not running in persistent memory, so if you're in a computer that doesn't have persistent memory, then you would need to have a slightly different version of your code, which didn't double up these key arrays. Um, uh, but then, of course, um, because you're trying to exploit the benefits of using persistent memory, that's always likely to be a case. You're, it's oft, you know, it's likely you're going to have to have different versions of your code for a system with persistent memory than it is um, one without persistent memory. Uh, it is possible to use the pmem library to map um, standard files and treat them as if they were in persistent memory and not volatile memory, but uh, uh, the performance won't be uh, anywhere near you get with, with non-volatile memory, uh, and the, thereby it's probably not useful for you uh, unless you're doing some sort of just design and prototyping work. Um, the, there is a, there are other ways uh, you could approach this problem as well, um, and, and one would be what we've already seen. You know, you do your reads from uh, persistent memory and your writes to DRAM, uh, um, and then, and then when you're finished doing your writes to DRAM, you then uh, copy that to persistent memory. Um, of course, it has a similar issue with um, correctness having to be preserved, so you would need multiple copies of those blocks. But if we do it in a blocked way, then we don't have to duplicate too much of a memory, so we can take a whole array and then work on a subsection of that array, uh, keep the working set in DRAM and only persist as, as required, uh, one subset of, at a time. Um, uh, and that would be a sort of a, a halfway house between persisting the full array uh, element by element and persisting the whole array with a single persist function at the end. Um, uh, but uh, working with the cache that you have to, to try and maintain performance. Um, and uh, there are also are other ways you could um, uh, design around this functionality, such as uh, creating helper threads, which move data to and from the non-volatile memory in the background. Uh, so you work on a chunk of the data, and then you move on to work on a new chunk of the data, and you create a thread which uh, takes that old chunk and moves off whilst your, your main program continues working. So that, that kind of uh, modification can be beneficial. Um, what would that really uh, look like? Um, so, one of the complexities, of course, of doing this persistent memory stuff is that we also we have to consider not only failures but failures within the persist functionality as well. Um, so, you know, one uh, example of this here would be um, how do I know when my persist is finished so that I know that data is correct? And then I can come back when I, if I have a failure, I can come back and re reload that data and just continue and use it as normal. Um, uh, and that probably means we need to add in some extra functionality to keep track of when, when persists occur um, and, and, and make sure that they have occurred. And so here's an example I've got by using two, a variable, um, which is a checkpoint flag, um, and then uh, and then the checkpoint data itself, which will persist. So first I set my checkpoint flag to minus one, and I persist that. So I know that that's been set to minus one in non-volatile memory before I'm starting my checkpoint. And then I checkpoint my actual data, which here is 100,000 elements, or 100,000 bytes. Um, and once that persist is finished, I then change my checkpoint flag and persist it again. And then once that persists, if a checkpoint flag has happened, then at some point in my, you know, later in my in my program, 
or when I resume, if I had a failure, I can read the checkpoint flag and I can say, is the checkpoint flag one? If it is, then I know that a checkpoint has completed successfully. Um, and of course, this does not get around having to have maybe two versions of a checkpoint variable, uh, one um, for uh, consistency and, and one for the update. But this is the kind of functionality that it's probably sensible to 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 uh, include if if we're caring about persistency here, because because it's important to remember that the failure can happen not just um, in the update, but also in the persistent call uh, as well. And so we need to be able to um, we need to be able to uh, check that our check our persistent ha has occurred properly. Um, to ensure that our data is in a consistent place. So you can see that you know, this kind of functionality is required if you want to do the low level programming, it sort of starts making the, um, the higher level libraries a bit more uh, attractive. We take care of all this kind of low level detail, but you know, of course you can build a function to do this for you and that's, that's, um, that's easy enough, but uh, it's the kind of thing that needs to be considered. Uh, and of course, it's uh, as we had in this example over here with our um, image sharpening problems, actually we get quite good performance if we just use the non-volatile memory for read-only data sets. Uh, it's maybe um, you know, not possible for all applications, but there are a reasonable range of applications where um, non-volatile memory just for a large read-only data set to be shared between you know, used by a single process or being shared between multiple processes in a node is not a stupid thing to do. So, you know, this picture here is from a, a radio astronomy um, uh, application which reconstructs uh, images based on very large data sets. And it uses a lot of memory partly because the data sets it reads in, the visibility files are big and it has to read them in to then use them to rebuild the, the image. Uh, and for something like that, then we can just read the data in, uh, have our you know, initial data, our visibility data on this non-volatile memory. Um, maybe not, maybe uh, we have slight performance impact from doing that, but it lets us use much less RAM or pack many more workers onto a node to read that data because we're not having to fill up our volatile memory with all this visibility data. We just can leave it in the non-volatile memory. Um, uh, and likewise, you know, there are a bunch of other application domain areas, bioinformatics, image processing, machine learning even, where there may be lots of, sort of read-only data sets or read-only databases uh, where using non-volatile memory might be a sensible choice, um, particularly if, we, you know, if you've got a genome um, and you've got large numbers of programs want to analyze the same genome, if you can load that up into non-volatile memory and leave it there, and then all the processors can access it. Um, it will certainly give you much better performance than if you go into a file system, or if, and it will give you much lower memory requirements than if you were storing it all in volatile, volatile memory. Um, now, as I've also just, uh, you know, we've pre previously mentioned, um, consistency and uh, safety. Um, or um, and not necessarily the same thing. So this, we also have this use case where, or we, we may have a requirement where we need to ensure the safety of our data. Uh, so some level of redundancy is required. So that could be uh, multiple copies across uh, non-volatile uh, DIMMs or across um, nodes with non-volatile memories. Uh, of course, there are much um, uh, cleverer ways of doing this with uh, mirroring, a sharding, erasure coding, append write, these kind of things. Uh, but if this is the kind of um, functionality you require, i.e. You, you need your data to be um, safe in terms of power outages, but also safe in terms of hardware failures, and you're going to be storing this data on these non-volatile uh, DIMMs, non-volatile memory long term, then you probably need to consider some level of this kind of functionality. Uh, and then you may want to move to a higher level product rather than program this directly. So something like uh, an object store like Intel DAOs, 
um, will do sharding or mirroring or, or, or raiding of your data across multiple things. Uh, likewise, you could set up a file system uh, like Lustre on top of this non-volatile memory to do that. Um, the DAOs uh, potentially, because it's designed to work with non-volatile memory, will give you better performance. But if you are uh, if you you need your data safety, uh, if that's sort of a key priority for you, and you're going to use this for long-term storage, and those are the kind of products that may be worth thinking. You know, you can design this functionality yourself, but it may not always be efficient to do so. Um, and so that's, you know, thinking about the, the kind of things you need to think about in terms of persistency. Um, then, as I've hinted at there, there are higher level uh, ways to exploit this um, memory, such as um, Intel's um, DAOs, um, or DAOs, I should say, uh, DAOs um, object store, and um, uh, object, yeah, object store, uh, data store, um, uh, tool or program or, or, or system where. Um, so this is this is not my slides here, but these are uh, slides from Intel. Uh, and and DAOS is a is is their effectively their version of a file system, but it's an object store which is designed to utilize um, non-volatile memory or SSDs or something like that to store data on, but across multiple nodes. And then you can go and ask it for the data and it gives you the data back. Uh, and so they are designing and, and deploying this um, to use things like this non-volatile memory um, for applications to, to, um, uh, to exploit, uh, but without the applications themselves having to directly program the non-volatile memory. So they give you, it gives you things like file interfaces to MPIO, HDF5, POSIX files, those kind of things. Or you can do sort of direct object store, uh, load store, uh, put get functionality. Of course, what it does not get you, uh, give you is the low level uh, direct access to the non-volatile memory and direct byte addressable uh, data um, operations, uh, but it does give you some additional functionality which may be beneficial to you, such as that mirroring or raiding or protection of your data and, and error correction or error checking and those kind of things. Um, uh, and there are also uh, other people doing similar kind of things. Um, so we uh, within this next gen IO project, we had a number of different um, a number of different approaches to trying to exploit non-volatile memory. And there we were looking at not only uh, enabling people to do programming of non-volatile memory um, within a single node, but thinking really about how you best exploit non-volatile memory across multiple nodes. Uh, inside a HPC system, uh, really with the idea that um, one of the issues we see with with IO on current HPC systems is, is performance variability, uh, and that performance variability becomes because most uh, HPC systems have this um, compute nodes, and then they're connected to some external file system, which all programs or compute nodes can access and that means you're competing with compute nodes, with other compute nodes, with other applications for the file system performance. So on our, on our big career here, we quite often see uh, like the green dots here, um, you know, the fastest bandwidth you get is 15 gigabytes a second. But, you know, quite a lot of the time you're seeing less than five gigabytes a second for the same benchmark, for the same um, number of cores, number of processes the same amount of data being read or, or written because um, the performance of a file system depends on what, what else is using it at the same time you're running here. So the nice thing about the non-volatile memory is that we can put the non-volatile memory inside the compute nodes and that means that each compute node is only competing with processes that are on that compute node and because for most 
parallel uh, computers, we we don't let more than one program use a compute node. You can sort of isolate the performance um, variation, and you can give I/O resources directly to uh, programs that are run on those compute nodes um, by putting the storage inside the compute nodes as well. Um, but of course, that brings a whole bunch of uh, problems. So unless people are going to take their applications and reprogram them to use the PMEM libraries or, or to use something like that, um, which of course is the, the most performant way of doing things, but maybe hard for large applications, there may be a lot of work to do that, um, then you know, what do you do, how do you enable people to use this memory from their applications? Um, when this storage is distributed through all the compute nodes in the system. And when you run a job, you might not know what compute node you're going to run on. Um, so um, we, we uh, similar to the sort of DAO's approach, we had a couple of um, uh, projects, uh, sorry, a, a couple of um, bits of software to help users with this. One was called Norms, which is, is a data scheduler. Um, and so the idea here was that you can tell the, the the job scheduler, um, which was slim in this case, you know what your job is, how many jobs you're going to run, what data flows between them, so we can share now jobs between workflows and between individual programs of a workflow, um, and then you know what data will stay on the node, what data will cut copied off the node, uh, what data each application will have, and then they file um, this thing called nodes with data scheduler will take the data and move it to the node for your compute job, give you access to it on the non-volatile data memory. You can then uh, read that data in your application, produce some data, and then the data schedule itself will, will um, pick that up and, and take that away. So that lets you use the non-volatile memory as a file system or as a memory space, um, as, a, as, a, um, as a burst buffer. Um, or indeed, actually, another piece of work that was, you know, another uh, approach that was was um, we looked at in the project was to see, you know, how could we build a file system which which went across these, so uh, across all the compute nodes, so the applications that were already using file I/O uh, could benefit from it, and of course, uh, you know, you don't get the full benefits of this byte addressable data access, but you you wouldn't have to change your application to use it. Um, so um, the, the, the uh, scientists at Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, developed a Gecko FS file system, um, and then uh, the data claim at uh, Object Store and Intel were developing the DAOS Object Store. Um, and so we were able to demonstrate on this prototype cluster that you have access to that we can take standard uh, applications and um, give them uh, good performance benefits. So here we took OpenFOAM and gave uh, and um, moved its file I/O onto a non-volatile memory, just using it as a file I/O, and we could get the um, OpenFOAM to be anywhere between 50% and 80% and faster by removing the I/O costs um, by using this. A high performance non volatile memory just through a file system on the compute nodes for, for open from. Uh, and likewise, for applications that used multi nodes um, one, and wanted a file system which looks something like a current just a parallel file system like Lustre or, or GPFS, we could use this IOR, this, we could use this uh, Gecko FS file system. Um, and get really quite nice performance um, scaling up across the nodes, uh, getting uh, you know uh, hundreds of gigabytes of read and write performance um, from the from an application again just by targeting it as as, as uh, targeting this non-volatile memory as as a file system. Uh, so the nice thing about this, of course, is it means that there are a bunch of technologies out there, which means you can already exploit this non-volatile memory from your applications by just treating it as a file system. Whilst you port your application to a non-volatile memory, 
um, and you can uh, make the updates to actually make it uh, use the non-volatile memory in a more efficient manner, i.e. through some of these more low-level programming uh, interfaces, and by restructuring your application to use the non-volatile memory in not just I.O., but then general data storage and general data processing, which will uh, give uh, you know more both uh, performance in terms of change of algorithm uh, and uh, performance in terms of raw I/O and, and, and storage uh, costs. And uh, so we so as this Gecko FS file system, our components for moving data in and in and uh, to on and off the, the compute nodes through uh, batch system like Slurm. Um, the Intel DAOS, uh, DAOS, DAOS um, object store and uh, um, another object store uh, called PyComps from the um, team at Barcelona as, as well, which is an integration with their <laughs> task-based programming uh, environment, uh, which lets you uh, take your application and, and run it on uh, a range of different hardware to, to, to exploit, uh, you know, large-scale parallelism uh, without having to program that parallelism necessarily in yourself, uh, or at least control them too strongly. Um, and the nice thing about it is that they've extended it so that you can persist your data to the non-volatile uh, memory if it's available in the kind of hardware that you're using. Um, so. Uh, and that lets not not only persist data, but also transfer data between different tasks in your simulation or your workflow or your uh, computational job. Um, so as a serialization library, which which means that, that data can be directly mapped between different tasks just by using the non-volatile memory um, from this uh, PyComps uh, computing framework. Uh, and, and storage interface, and it, it, it's a relatively simple thing. Where it, you know, for this example, because they have their own Python and Java um, programming sort of languages or libraries for this PyComps uh, approach, you can just uh, specify to to make persistent the data, uh, and uh, the data will uh, be, the the runtime system will automatically. Um, undertake that persistence for you. Um, so that's just a, a little flavor of, of, of different ways that you could uh, undertake persistent memory programming on on, on non-volatile um, memory programming. Um, the uh, as I, uh, you know, as I've said already, I think the, the the main approach from my perspective is the low-level performance you get from the low-level programming li uh, library, the PMM, uh, PMDK uh, PMEM library, uh, but that does provide you with uh, the complexities and the headaches of uh, having to ensure persistence and co and and coherence and correctness yourself. There are higher level programming libraries and then other tools which will also exploit this memory, albeit not necessarily given the full performance that you can get from this kind of hardware. Uh, but the nice thing is the hardware has perform, you know, significant performance potential. So uh, real benefits in terms of capacity, real benefits in terms of energy in the sense that when you're reading from a data or you're not using the data, it doesn't use very much energy at all compared to DRAM. And also really benefits in terms of allowing small data movements for persistent storage uh, compared to standard uh, I/O practices. Uh, but programming for that persistence and programming it, it is not necessarily straightforward. Um, it's easy to get to get a memory and to use it, but, but to make sure that your program will be correct under all failure scenarios is always a bit more challenging. Programming for the capacity is easier. So if you just want the big memory space, then that's pretty straightforward. Um, and you know, if you want to just get started with non-volatile memory, then you can just start off by pointing your uh, file I/O to it, and then thinking about uh, where you'd see benefits if you could change your application and move beyond file I/O to to byte addressable uh, data movements. Um, but you know the performance benefits potentially are there uh, in terms of you know very 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 high I/O performance per node, 
if you can exploit this sort of storage and uh, memory functionality correctly. Um, and uh, as before, if you're you know interested in playing around with that, we have this hardware with this prototype. We've got these guest accounts which you will stay open for the next week, so you can have a look at the practicals. Um, and if you want to um, play longer term, just let me know. Um, get in touch, and we can um, we can um, uh, talk about that. Uh, but it shouldn't be a problem. So that's all I had to say. Um, we've come to the end of the time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, that's uh, I'm more than welcome to be more than welcome to um, ask them now, um, or um, just get in touch uh, over email uh, later date. And that's perfectly fine.